So uh, I'm, I'm honored uh, today to do some introductions here, and I'll start by saying a few words of, about uh, Colonel Bezins and uh, Captain Pagano. I was the commander of uh, two men, uh, and I went out to Cure Sarge. Uh, uh, Pete was the XO of the Cure Sarge at the time. Of course, he pleaded up to be the Commodore since that time. And, uh, and Mark came down to be uh, one of my MU commanders, and he went immediately to his first training session in uh, the Midwest, in Indiana, as I recall. And, and his first weekend on the job, they were hit by floods, tornadoes, and all manner of natural disaster. And, and he uh, jumped right in there to provide assistance. So he, he was off and running uh, at a good start uh, to what ultimately became uh, two deployments. And of course, uh, the last one is the one they'll talk about today, but I, I wanted to, to take as much credit as I could today for what Mark and Pete have done. <laughs> and, uh, I attribute much of that to my, my brief association with the, with the team. Uh, but, but seriously, uh, this is uh, a great opportunity. Uh, Pete, Mark, thank you for being here to, to share this with us. Um, I've been uh, around the Marine Corps many, many years. I've been around the Muse and know that business, and I, I have to tell you that this ARGMU deployment uh, may be one of the, the, the best uh, in, in the history of what is a tremendously successful strategic uh, program. Uh, they left a month early uh, in August to, uh, to provide uh, flood relief in Pakistan. If, if you recall, going back now almost a year, Pakistan was hit with devastating floods and they left early to provide relief and assistance uh, for that effort. Um, of course they did in absolutely um, grand style, uh, provided uh, combat operations uh, in Afghanistan simultaneously, conducted uh, counter piracy operations, uh, did by my reckoning at least five major theater security cooperation events. I, I assume most of it in uh, disaggregated operations, some of the most challenging uh, that an RDU can do. And um, the, of course they were there during the heart of the time, what we now call the Arab Spring, when uh, beginning with uh, Tunisia, uh, Libya, Egypt, uh, all of the uh, regional instability and uncertainty that, is, that has uh, been developing and continues on to this day. I can tell you uh, absolutely that during that time, the CENTCOM commander saw the ARGMU as his strategic reserve. And um, I have no doubt they were planning for uh, and or executing every conceivable possibility in that whole string of um, Arab Spring uh, operations that we saw uh, on the news. And then of course, um, during uh, Operation Odyssey Dawn in Libya, they were really the U.S. centerpiece of that whole uh, operation. When, when Libya really heated up, combat operations in Libya, and um, one of the most uh, notable events of that is the rescue of the F-15 pilot uh, that I'm sure we'll, we'll hear more about today. But uh, absolutely um, a spectacular validation of the of the uh, power, the strategic power of, of the RMU, and uh, they did an absolutely uh, fantastic job. So to both of you, congratulations, a great job, and thanks for being here with us today. Thank Please, you. everybody, let's welcome Mark. Thank you. Well, thank you, General, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have a few slides here. Uh, and we'll step through it to uh, kind of capture uh, what we did on this deployment. But really, I think uh, the, the focus is to throw this open to some discussion, and uh, uh, we're, we're happy to, uh, to do that. Next slide, please. Oh, you're right. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. Okay. Well, uh, quite frankly, we could probably brief the entire deployment right off this slide. Uh, but we will go into greater detail. But this uh, just gives you the scope of uh, the influence that this relatively small task organization had, uh, not only across one theater, but across multiple theaters, uh, and in many cases over the course of the deployment, simultaneously across multiple theaters. 
But uh, as the general said, we did deploy a month early. We were scheduled to deploy September of 2010, uh, and instead we deployed in August of 2010 as a result of the Pakistan flooding. So that uh, compressed our training uh, for the deployment. Uh, it also uh, caused us to lose some maintenance uh, phases for the ships. However, uh, we're still able to sustain over the course of the deployment a 90% at sea uh, posture for those ships. Uh, and that was through a lot of hard work uh, as well as some great logistics support that we enjoyed across the theaters. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, we deployed a month early. We're an eight and a half month deployment now. And we wound up executing missions across the full spectrum of military operations, from humanitarian assistance in Pakistan to combat operations in both Libya and Afghanistan with uh, Battalion 38, so and, and just about everything in between. So uh, this, we feel this deployment really highlights the unique capabilities that forward deployed Navy and Marine Corps sea-based forces bring to not only national leadership but also the theater commander. We provide options, we provide flexibility, uh, and we're going to go into some detail on that. We planned a traditional deployment, one where it would be mostly aggregated. In other words, the ships, the Marines would all stay together in one tight formation and sequential with an emphasis on theater security cooperation and bilateral events. But the reality was, life happens, as Mark likes to say, and instead we were disaggregated, dispersed, across the theater and multiple theaters. We had a complex deployment as a result of what was going on, turmoil in the region, and it was one of continuous planning and simultaneous execution, where we were planning for missions, some of which did not execute, while we were executing other missions. Did I leave anything out? You're doing great, sir. OK. <laughs> OK, so by way of introduction, who, who are we? On the blue side, uh, the Cure Sergeant Amphibious Ready Group was uh, led by uh, myself, uh, Fibron 4, and my staff, and I had the privilege of, of leading this, uh, this fine organization on the blue side. The USS Cure Sarge was the big deck amphib, the LHD-3. Uh, this ship, uh, if you're not familiar with them, 44,000 tons. It has a 844-foot flight deck and a well deck that can accommodate three air cushion landing craft, as well as medical facilities that are second only to the hospital ship's mercy and comfort. So that ship, that class of ship, brings tremendous capability, not only for combat operations, but for humanitarian assistance and response to disasters. Carter Hall and Ponce, two somewhat smaller amphibs, smaller in relative terms, they're still large ships, displacing 18,000 tons and in a range of about 600 feet long. They also have flight decks for helicopters. They also have well decks for uh, air cushion landing craft and conventional landing craft. So these ships bring to any part of the world a floating airfield and a harbor that could be maneuvered anywhere in the world. Supporting those ships was Tactical Air Control Squadron 21. This is a, a group of officer and enlisted air traffic <coughs> controllers, to put it in simple terms, uh, that provide that airspace command and control. They are configured to do this for an amphibious operation. But as we'll uh, get later on to Odyssey Dawn, they had a role that was much wider. Fleet Surgical Team 6 supplemented the medical uh, capabilities of the ARC, and the Naval Beach Crew Detachment helped us run the landing craft as well as the beach landing zones. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, first, uh, General Stoller, thank you very much for introducing us today. Also, thank you for your leadership and the freedom of action you gave the commander to what you had at the Mount County Camp. Uh, General Gray, my pleasure to meet you today, sir. Uh, we have so much to thank you for this program to start off with, the, the whole new Marine Expedition Unit program that General Gray's uh, child, uh, along with the way we think. And I think as we go through some of the things today, particularly uh, some of our actions in Libya, the things that you try to teach me as lieutenant, sir, way back, uh, how to think about the enemy as a contest of will, not as a system, uh, will come not so much as a contrast of how to fight a war, but a collaboration of how the Joint Force does it better because of our unique contributions. Uh, Mr. Young, I'm looking forward to meet you today, sir. I, you're going to see some of the things that you helped nurture and, and help us procure along the way. Uh, they really shine here uh, during this deployment. Thank you very much. 
uh, General Reese, thank you for having us today. A, a few of my other friends here uh, that I haven't seen in a while, so great to see you. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with the Marine Expeditionary Unit, very simply this. Uh, the Marine Corps at the end of the day is a ground centric organization. Everything we do supports a Marine rifleman. Because at the end of the day, humans live on the dirt. We need to control ground. Right, so the way the Marine Corps organizes is what we call a Marine Air Ground Task Force. Air Ground Supported by Logistics, a MAGTAP. A MU is just the smallest of the standing Marine Air Ground Task Forces. Very simply, there's a guy in charge, me with a staff, and, and a bunch of intel and communicators and things like that to support. We have an infantry battalion that's reinforced. We have a composite squadron that has five different type aircraft, from MV-22s to Cobra and Huey attack and utility helicopters to uh, Harrier, Stovall, short takeoff, vertical landing attack jets, and then finally the CH-53 helicopter. And you'll see each of those signs as we go along here today. A logistics battalion that does three things. It supports the whole of in general, but its real mission is to support that battalion landing team in combat. And they got to do some of that uh, in Afghanistan. A mom and pop organization that actually got split in two directions. And that's gonna show you some of the flexibility and some of the rebuilding it while you're in flight things that we had to do during this deployment. And finally, uh, you know, one of those things, because there's a force multiplier, just two KC-130J Hercules aircraft that really unlock our capabilities nowadays and how we do business. And you, and you can see that from the Commodore's first slide, if I could take you back for a moment, uh, when I first came in the Marine Corps, it was five ships in the yard back then, and they never split apart. They went everywhere together. And I remember in 1991, you know, you know, many of you remember Colonel Fight. I think he had 24th the American back then. They, they split his arg up during his deployment. Oh my God, the world almost came to an end. And then during the 90s, we started splitting up the ships more and more. Because day to day, if you're not at war, the combat commanders need you to engage. Because the only thing we need more than an enemy to go kill is friends. That's what the nation really needs. So you engage to build up your partners, and you engage to prevent conflict. Because that's what we're really here to do. Where are we today? <coughs> With the MV-22 in the region ahead. I'm a CV-26 pilot. I go 75 miles, I get tired, I got to turn around and I get gas. Right, these guys go 300 miles. With this aircraft, they can, they can cover a whole combatant commander's region. So at any given time, not just the ships were separated, but the Marines and capabilities from those ships were spread across 3,000 miles of a region. That's, that's what we call disaggregated. Uh, some would call that dismembered at certain times. Okay, why do we do that? Exactly as I said, because you engage. You, you take on all these things that the country needs. The other side of that equation is why do we aggregate? And that's a question we have to always make sure we ask also. We aggregate for combat. And so all those things we do with 29 Palms for the Army at the National Training Center, we can't lose sight of those, particularly as we draw down from combat in Afghanistan. So we did all those things during this deployment because when it came time to put some of our forces in Afghanistan, we actually did aggregate the arm up in the Northern Arabian Sea and in, in the Kuwait. So there you have it. That's the MU in a nutshell. We did have two uh, ground combat elements, and as the brief goes out, I'll explain that a little bit more. All right, as we said, we deployed a month early. I, I think what's more noteworthy here isn't the fact that we deployed a month early. It's what we did from the time we got notified. From the time we got notified that we we're going to deploy early. Three days later, 72 hours later, we had two LNOs in Pakistan, in country, starting to work the issue, <coughs> starting to develop the situation. Within nine days, four CH-53s had been broken down and were being strategically lifted to Camp Bastion. Within 25 days, the whole ARGU team was underway. By the way, what happened between them, because we were deploying a month early, is all those things that you do the month before you deploy was a crash program. Second Marine aircraft wing was doing modifications on those aircraft, for example, that made those aircraft shine for a long, long deployment. Some of the things that we left on the cutting room floor that aren't even in the brief. A 1,200-mile self-recovery of CH-53 <coughs> from Pakistan to the Gulf of Aden. A 2,800-mile self-recovery of MV-22s from Afghanistan to Libya. Those kind of things don't happen unless you have healthy, well-resourced airframes. Uh, those things aren't even in the brief today. I wanted to bring that up. 
We talk about the technical capabilities of our Marines and sailors. We talk about how we train them, how we train them to think. And you all are familiar with that through the war here. We have kids younger than my own sons, 20-year-olds, that knock on doors and compounds, not knowing what's behind them. You know, the way they think on their feet, the courage, everything they bring is, is just eye water. Okay. But they also, at the end of the day, Marines work. Pakistan. Originally, the flood started off in northern Pakistan, 15th view went in there, and the first thing that happened is the mountain roads got washed out. That's why you need the helicopters in Israel. But as the floodwaters started to flow, they flowed south down towards the ocean, and we knew before we got there that it wasn't going to be the high ground, it was going to be the middle of Pakistan. Literally, by the time we got there, we knew we needed to go to the central of the country because there were literally swaths of what used to be land 100 miles by 125 miles that were just clear water, completely disconnected populations. Now you had to have helicopters there. By the way, there wasn't much dry ground to put a helicopter on. So that small strip of land right in the middle of Pakistan, a little place called Pano Akul, is where we put our folks. They are now living in the same conditions as the people they're trying to help. Hundreds of thousands of people. Okay, so this is the environment your Marines and your sailors are working in. 103 degrees, average day and night temperature for 57 days. No tow trackers, no forklifts. World Food Program truck shows up. We work with the Pakistani military on where the needs are, and we help them know where their needs were because we had those capabilities. Every day that truck would show up, over 57 days, three million pounds of food were loaded by the same guys pushing this 53 the C-53 helicopter, the same ones who maintain it, were the same guys who loaded the aircraft by hand, were the same guys who then got on the aircraft and offloaded it by hand to the people who needed it. The only rule we had, got covered up. If you fly, you work. The ambassador of uh, Pakistan showed up one day. No huss. <laughs> Dark suit, flower bags. Pillsbury Doughboy comes to mind. Uh, there you have it. You got some great stats there, and that, I think that covers it. Uh, if that's uh, you know, if you want your bumper sticker, any climb in place, that was a climb and that was a place. Uh, fantastic work. Uh, thousands of people whose lives were changed. The other thing, I don't know how much reservoir of goodwill we got. There's a whole lot of people there whose lives were changed because of the work we did. Next slide, please. Uh, I think Pete might have brought up the theater security cooperation. When you're not fighting, you're trying to do good things. Little banners up here. You see, some of them are uh, blue and green. Some just blue. Blue is Navy blue. Green is Marine Corps green. First three exercises were blue and green. Correction: two of them were. Jordan, we flew Marines up there. The Marine Corps has a program where we work with the Jordanian military because they actually are deployed in Afghanistan now. So we help nurture them along to make sure that their forces are ready to go. That's a Marsden sponsored program that we helped out with. Edge Mallet in Kenya. Outside of uh, training agreements in Djibouti, uh, this is the first time a new arm has gone back into East Africa since we stood after come up. And for those of you who are familiar with COCOM boundaries, you understand that Al-Qaeda does not honor them. We unfortunately do honor them to the letter. So this took about a year to work out. This paid dividends in, in not only the exercise, but in, in some of the operations. Uh, great work there to include uh, helping to rebuild schools and working with the Kenyan military. Uh, Iron Magic, I'm going to pass the microphone over to Pete so he can talk that one through to the right side of the slide. Thanks, Mark. Uh, as the general alluded to, these uh, bilateral exercises were done in a disaggregated manner. So while some of the ships were doing national tasking, other ships were doing bilateral exercises with their marine uh, attachments, some cases without marines. Uh, and again, that was driven by operational commitments, for example, of Italian going into Afghanistan. The result was all these exercises were originally scheduled to be blue-green amphibious-centric exercises. However, because of the real-world operational commitments, uh, the players were changed up, and we had to replan on the fly the uh, programs for these exercises because uh, the theater commanders, as well as our, us, realize the value and importance of keeping this engagement with these uh, various nations. So uh, the bumper sticker here, flexible, relevant, made an impact. 
because despite operational commitments, we still uh, honored our commitments to these countries in participating in these exercises. Uh, flexible in that we had to replan them on the fly uh, and relevant in that they were still, the nations came away happy. And we actually got some good training out of it as, out as well. Especially Iron Magic was notable for, uh, for me uh, in that this was a fairly complex amphibious exercise. This was, Mark earlier said, uh, we did everything on this deployment except an amphibious landing. And I corrected him and said, no, we did do an amphibious landing as well. And that was with uh, UAE, and it was a, uh, it involved uh, elements of uh, 26 Mu, uh, two of the three ships of the Ark, Carter Hall and Ponce, as well as the, uh, the Emiratis and their Air Force, uh, their naval infantry. Uh, and it, was, it culminated in a live fire amphibious exercise with uh, joint force uh, participation. Uh, it also allowed us to flex some imaginative uh, command and control uh, structures with regard to the, uh, the ARG and the, uh, and the pit run. So that was actually valuable not only for our partner nation, but also for ourselves as well. Uh, and that's really, I think, all I want to say about this is that uh, even in the, the, the heat of operational uh, commitments, we still uh, manage to execute these bilateral exercises because they are equally vital. Uh, as Mark said, uh, we need to uh, make friends, not just kill enemies. All the good fun. All right, Afghanistan. So we've talked a bit about you know, the range of military operations, the left hand and humanitarian assistance, theater security cooperation. Now we're going to take you to the, the, the right end of the scale here a little bit in Afghanistan. Uh, it hasn't been unusual for a Marine Expeditionary Unit to go into Iraq or Afghanistan and take a mule. This is the first time that we cut a mule apart, that I, I recall in my career, certainly. Uh, shortly after the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, General Petraeus and General Mattis started talking. And uh, what was happening is the Marine Corps, as most of you know, runs the Regional Command Southwest in the Helmand Province of Afghanistan. Up in the far northeast section, uh, up in a place called Sangin, was uh, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. And for all the Marine brethren out there, you know they were taking some pretty heavy uh, casualties out there in, uh, in the month of October. I think 20 killed alone in the month of October. For them. There was a vacuum that was kind of right between them and the main part of the Helmand Province. And the idea here was is that we could stick a unit in there, fill that vacuum, disrupt the Taliban during the winter months so they couldn't get a spring offensive going. That was the initial idea, but it did much, much more. So what happened is Pete took all three of his ships up to Kuwait. We were able to told us all of our forces there. Kuwait's a wonderful place. We even have a slide to talk about to do some last minute pre-combat training. And during the month of January, starting January 8th, we started actually moving the main body of forces from Kuwait. By January 30th, 1,350 man battalion landing team 3-8 was in combat in the upper Thresh Valley, Supported by six MB-22s, four HOWs, and about 40 folks from uh, CLB 26 filling out their combat logistics trees. Here's what they did. They not only denied this enemy sanctuary, they not only took some pressure off 3-5, but what you're looking for long term is things that will help the Afghanistan government take the confidence of their people and actual tangible things that benefit the people, people themselves. This is a black line, if I had a better map, that runs right uh, many of you are probably familiar with the Ring Road in Afghanistan Route 1, right? So that Ring Road. And then there's a road comes up, that comes off that Ring Road that goes right up to the central part of this Huresh Valley up towards Sangin, where the 3rd County 5th Marines was. The problem was, because of a lack of security, the government couldn't get the road paid. So our, our primary mission was to provide the security to get that road paid. And in the time that 3-8 was there, almost that whole road got paid. So what we went from when we first got there was no road, and all the vehicles that were bringing supplies up to 3-5 were very susceptible to IED. Daily occurrence of IED attacks with that ramps. No losses, but losses of vehicles. By the time we left, that road had 750 vehicles a day traversing. Two things going on there. Obviously, one, we're getting logistics to combat units without, without losses. Probably that's a good thing. The other is, 
you need gas stations for commerce. All those other things that come along with, with you know, having barrel fare for, for uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, civilian populace. So that was a good thing. It showed that the government could do something that we were able to help just by providing the security environment. So, so really positive developments there. Uh, the last is we got to work just inside Marine Corps lines. We tried to keep a relationship with special operation forces and nurture that. We nurtured it on several occasions during this deployment, both uh, the Navy and the Marine side. This was one more example. In this case, uh, working with uh, Marine Special Operations Command folks. So great work there by them. In the meantime, while we put those forces in there, the rest of the MU, we took risk because this was the main effort. This is this is live combat. So while that happened, we reconstituted the MU uh, back in Kuwait and got ready for follow-on missions. And there were many. Next slide. All right, flashing you a little bit forward on scene center here. The next thing we had on our plate was to be prepared for NEOs. Uh, first was the Special Tribunal of Lebanon. The indictments were coming out. Uh, Prime Minister Herrera had been, been assassinated. I think it was 2005, if I remember correctly. His son was the Prime Minister. Big problem there because uh, Lebanese had lost and threatened a great big problem. That was the first be prepared to we had. Uh, we aggregated two of the ships in, in the uh, Gulf of Maine for that. That kind of centered, and then the air is spray blue. The end of February finds two of the three ships in the yard in the northern end of the Red Sea actually watching Egypt. We had a forward command element in the embassy uh, watching ringside and Tahrir Square. The Kearsarge was there along with the, the carrier USS Enterprise. And so that's the end of February. Egypt is finally crested and looks like it's going to start start mellowing out. So that's your scene setter as we get towards Odyssey Dawn of Libya. Interesting thing here. We have two big decks. We have a, a big deck amphib and we have an aircraft carrier there. As Odyssey Dawn is warming up, we actually expected that our missions would be things like humanitarian assistance, possibly some non-combatant evacuations, and a small chance of strike at that time. Our real hope, though, was that if we went through, was that we could take Enterprise with us. Because if you're going to do strike, and if you look at the geography of the Mediterranean, it's really a maritime gig to get down to Libya. And it's a long way. You're going to see that in just a moment. Our hope was that the carrier would go with us. The bottom line is the carrier was directed to go the other way because it was needed to provide strike support in the Afghanistan. So yeah, the lesson I learned there was you're never going to have enough aircraft carriers to address every need that's out there. However, six Harriers, or hopefully in the future, six F-35Bs off of a big deck amphib, they can do one hell of a, a job in the smaller wars and the smaller contingencies out there. This is just going to be a great example of, of one of those ones that we can talk about there. So there we go. 2nd of March, we come through the Suez Canal. 5th of March, one of the happier days of my command tour. 1st Battalion, 2nd Marine shows up. Thank you, Marine Corps. Always has something ready to go because we will never not answer the call. I've got a ground combat element back. Uh, although we, we politically said we would not put boots on the ground, the fact of the matter is, when we had to rescue the downed F-15 pilot, when we launched the recovery force, we always try to launch a combat force alongside it in case things go south. First Battalion, Second Marines was a quick reaction force that night. There are also facilities and sites in Libya that we wanted to make sure didn't go the wrong direction, fall into the wrong hands, had the wrong thing happen with them. We were tasked with a lot of those things. That was for giant second degrees. So there's your setup for Odyssey Dog. What have you seen so far? You've seen these naval platforms literally traverse thousands and hundreds of miles to be in the right place at the right time, bringing their own airfield, bringing their own logistics, bringing all the capabilities you need to do for whatever the country needed. All right. What Pete demonstrated with our exercise is the ability not only for operations, but in exercises to scale things up or to scale them down. It's like a good rheostat to bring just the amount of power that was needed. Next slide, please. Pete, we'll start with you, sir. Okay, thanks. Uh, I would say that the, the, 
banner that should be on here is outsized effects for a relatively small group, because that's really what we did. Uh, here's our jargon, 26 Me was really the centerpiece, certainly in the, in the first uh, several days of Odyssey Dawn of the U.S. contribution to that joint task force. And we executed missions that really had impact throughout the joint operating area. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the brief, Tactical Air Control Squadron 2-1 Detachment is a group of air traffic controllers, if you would, that are responsible for providing airspace control, generally for a relatively small amphibious objective area. <coughs> However, in the opening days, as the Joint Task Force was ramping up, as uh, uh, AWACS assets were being prepared, uh, the, they, the responsibility for airspace control fell to TACRON 2-1 uh, detachment embarked in USS Kearsarge. They were providing that AWACS-like service of airspace control for the entire joint operating area, not just for uh, Mark's Harriers, but the other U.S. aircraft as well as coalition aircraft as well. Uh, they were performing that mission of airspace command and control. Uh, additionally, the Joint Intelligence Center in USS Kearsarge, which is a collaborative effort made up of Bibron 4, 26 Mu, as well as Kearsarge, uh, ship's company, intelligence specialists and intelligence officers fused into a single team. They were providing joint intel support, uh, again, for the entire joint operating area to include uh, intelligence support for our coalition partners. Uh, as well as Kearsarge, a ship that is configured, big as it is, is configured to support only two staffs, generally a Navy Vibron and, and a Marine uh, Expeditionary Unit command element. Uh, during the height of our participation in Odyssey Dawn, was actually supporting four staffs. In addition to R2, uh, Admiral Klein, Expeditionary Strike Group 5, uh, wearing the hat of CTF-64 was embarked, as was a destroyer uh, squadron, uh, Commodore and his staff, Desron 60, who was performing the mission of uh, uh, Sea Combat Commander. All were embarked in Kearsarge. Uh, we were able to make it work. It was tight, but uh, it, it was uh, doable, and it, again, shows the flexibility of uh, these platforms. Uh, with that, Mark, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you. There are so many lessons to learn from this slide. And, and, you know, it, it took me six deployments, so hopefully we'll, I can try to communicate it in less than six deployments to everybody here. You've got this wonderful power projection platform that you can move anywhere you want. In, in this case, you move it right there. About 125 miles, often as close as 50 miles, right off somebody's coastline. Okay, That's going to mean a number of things to us. It's going to mean a short commute to work, first of all, for our Harrier gas. All right? The JPEC, the Joint Force Air Component Commander, the headquarters was up in Ramstein, Germany. A lot of the jets that they were flying, the TAC air jets, the F-16s, F-15s, those kind of things, were up in northern Italy and Aviano. Other aircraft were as far away as England, and if you wanted the global strike mission, you had to get it from the United States. Again, we were right there. What did that mean? You need the joint force. You need big air to take care of those, those system-level things of fight and war, <coughs> parts of opinion, integrated air defense systems command and controls as systems, those, those kind of things, establishing a big new flying zone. You need the JFAC to do that, and they, they think those big thoughts. The, the, what I found to be a qualitative difference, though, for us, was the way that General Gray taught us how to think about war, which is, it's not so much a system as it is me making you quit. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, you'll fight through your systems, but i got to figure out how to be quick. So we brought, we just brought a different flavor to this thing. And, and it worked nicely for us because the things that we were trying to do in support of the United, States, United Nations Security Council Resolution 1973 was protect the civilians. At the time this started, in, in the, the third week in March, around the 19th of March, what was happening? Ms. Rada over here, uh, Gaddafi's forces were already installed. They were already in, in, in a bit of a pickle. Uh, but over here in Benghazi, the second largest city with 600,000 people, he was just on the edge. And if you remember the president's speech, which was the same guidance that I received over the theater, the president named four cities. It was a city way out here to the west that I can't pronounce too far outside my reach. However, 
This big city right here, Benghazi, right there. Ajdabaya, right there. Misrata, right there. Our thoughts were that if we could hit the tactical forces in the backside of Benghazi that night, that we could hopefully get them to recoil, pull back, and we got it. It worked. We weren't the only ones that had that idea. We had some F-15s out there with us the first night. We got them to recoil, and we were able to have some success chasing them back down south and then west. Will our car win the day? I don't know, we're still, we're still trying over there. But it bought time. It bought time for the opposition. It bought time for coalitions to do the things that they have to do. So, so we had good effect. Keys to that, you know, how we thought about things. The kind of things a tactical force has don't sit still. Like a command and control system sits still. Like an integrated air defense system often sits still. The kind of things that we were really good at, tanks, armored personnel carriers, mobile scud launchers, those kind of things, mobile forces. We were able to take our intelligence with all that great joint intel center stuff we have on the ship. We were able to fuse it together and literally we could hand CJ here, one of our air pilots, as he's walking his aircraft, he's got the latest pictures right when he's taken off. So CJ takes off, he flies in the objective area 125 miles away, which even for a Harrier you can reach that. He looks, he looks down through his gun. Well, I had to take the shot. It was good. <laughs> at 35, it was longer legs. So all good. <laughs> he looks down, and, and as evidenced by the, the number of sorties they flew and the number of engagements they had for sortie, that, that high efficiency rate that we had, because he would show up on the target. He didn't have to be smart. He could have been a 46 pilot. He looks down, and bam, it's right there. And all he has to do is get you know all that stuff that you know these guys do when they shoot expensive watches. And, and he got to kill. All because we had, and, and Joe Gray taught us that OODA is a word, observe, or you decide not. All because our mental OODA loop was about 250 feet from the Joint Intel Center to the Red Room to a jet. Our physical OODA loop was 125 miles. Okay? Uh, we didn't, we could take off, do a sortie, come back, get gas, rearm, get an Intel update, and send them right back out. And we usually did that twice a night. I just contrast that with, with a JPEG who had a longer commute to work. From Aviano to the target area is about 1,000 miles. You have to at least do a pre-mission tank. You at least have to do a post-mission tank. And you've got to do another tank in there somewhere. The joint force is a wonderful thing. And I, I don't want to disparage the joint community. Think about Odyssey Dawn for a second. Three weeks, basically the month of March, from start to finish that they stood up a joint for us, executed, and stood it back down. That's pretty darn good. I mean, in the joint world, that's, that's damn fast. I, I, I wanted to contrast that, though, because when you're talking about crisis response, there's taking days to be ready to go to where I, I, I stopped following what we do a turnkey operation. Our engine's already running. When the care sergeant shows up, she's ready to go, whatever that mission is. I think that's the real qualitative difference we bring in crisis response with the Navy Marine Corps team. So we were able to conduct very high tempo operations. First to Benghazi, then Ajdabaya, and then, you know, in order to keep CJ's commute short, we just moved the ship over towards Madrata and did the same things over there. Okay. Our biggest challenge, our biggest challenge was collateral damage. It was easy for us early on for targeting. And you've seen some of that now. Because the only guy who had military equipment at the beginning of this conflict was the guy who we know is bad. As time went on, some of the opposition picked up military hardware, and as all enemies do, the regime is adapted and is using technical vehicles. However, we had, for at least the first 12 days, some very clean <coughs> targeting we were able to do. But we did it from an altitude, and, and we're going to get some more story in a minute here from CJ and, and Brillo about why we had to stay high. And very simply, it's because there was an aircraft. An anti so, some good hardware to include a scud missile launcher. I wish we had the video today. My apologies. Uh, it's a lovely video because the secondary effects off that thing because it was loaded up and ready to go were, were absolutely wonderful. Stovall, for those that don't know Stovall and that, uh, practice that religion, short takeoff, vertical landing. It's basically a, a strike aircraft that flies off of a big deck amp. And it's what the Marine Corps uniquely does and pay great, great dividends here. Bam, 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 bam. I think I hit them all. All right. 
the trap, uh, frankly, the two rock stars that are right here. Let me set the scene for you. March 19th strikes to you. We know who the bad guy is. We all know that Muammar Gaddafi, pardon me, he's a despot, he's a scumbag for a whole host of reasons. So we know who the bad guy is. What we don't know is who the opposition is. You really don't. I'm not sure who they are personally right now, but we didn't know who they were then. We didn't know if they were friendly to us. Honest to goodness. The other thing is this. When, when Muammar Gaddafi was pressing on Benghazi, he wasn't just pressing from the south. He was trying to do like any good commander would. He was trying to choke him off from the, uh, the, the east and, and the southeast going to Tobruk. So on, on the night of the 21st of March, so we're into the third day, CJ's getting ready to go out for another night of strikes. He's racking up some good hardware, paint little bombs in his aircraft, all like in World War II stuff. We still get today. All right, he's getting ready to walk, middle of the night, and we get the word that an F-15 crew has ejected. So your setup is there. Somewhere around 12 miles east of Benghazi, a very uncertain situation because we know we've got a crew that ejected. We don't know why. We do know that uh, joint forces were pursuing a strategic anti-air missile site that night. We didn't know if that was part of why the aircraft might have gone down. We didn't know if it was a uh, shoulder launch uh, anti-air threat. We really, we just didn't know. So we obviously had to assume that, that it was uh, something that might have shot them down. We didn't know the nature of who was on the ground at that time. And so as you hear the story unfold, although we can look at our rear rear mirror and say, wow, you know, that wasn't so bad. You know, why did you, I, I want to put this in context so that as you hear the story, you understand some of the emotions and decisions and you can place yourself there and understand why I was sucking my thumb in the L block in my rocking chair for about half the night. Uh, all this was three hours start to finish. And if I can, I want, I want to introduce uh, CJ Grunke and uh, throw a call here. CJ's a Harrier pilot. He flew a number of strike missions. He flew that night as a forward air controller airborne. And Brillo here is a good look at that B-22 pilot who flies an aircraft uh, over twice as fast as mine, and he reminds me very often that I'm slow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir, for the, uh, the introduction. Uh, did a, a nice job of setting the stage for everyone uh, as far as what we were, we were thinking and facing uh, on night three of uh, Operation Odyssey Dawn. Uh, so now I'll just begin with uh, what I was thinking that night. I briefed with my crew, just like we'd done the two nights previous, to go out and do armed reconnaissance. and. Uh, once we're done with our brief, we made our way down to the wardroom to get a last bit of uh, uh, food before we launched on our five-hour stealth mission. Um, at that point, uh, we were in the wardroom. We got a little bit of uh, indications that, hey, maybe an F-15 went down. Uh, not sure why, but we may need to train, uh, change our mission to a, uh, a trap, tactical recovery of aircrew and personnel. Uh, at that point, we made our way down to the LPOC to start gathering the information on, uh, on, on what exactly had happened. The, uh, the main operations center there on the ship. Uh, while we were there, information came in. Uh, the UCO made the call, made the determination that he had enough information to launch us uh, to the objective area to get overhead and, uh, and take over uh, in the recovery effort for the pilot. <coughs> At this point, uh, I, I took the last known coordinate of the, uh, the pilot. I plotted that on a map uh, so that I could take that with me in the aircraft uh, when I launched. Uh, I made my way out to to the jets uh, for, for the launch. Uh, my women and I were uh, airborne within 45 minutes of initial notification there in the wardroom uh, to, to make our way to the objective. Uh, as we, we launched, uh, we were about 150 to 160 nautical miles uh, from the objective area. Uh, the ship was steaming towards it. Uh, it took me about 30 minutes to make my way to, to, the, uh, to the area. Uh, once I switched over to uh, CSAR Alpha, the frequency that the, uh, the down pilot was talking on via uh, handheld radio, I uh, just began to listen to, to what was going on to start building my situational awareness. Uh, and as I did that, I could hear him whispering on the radio to an F-16 that was overhead uh, who was trying to help him, direct him to a more secure hide location. That was the, the moment that I realized this was no longer training, this was no longer the, uh, the fields of North Carolina. Uh, this was a real uh, guy on the ground who was fearing for his life and was uh, being chased. Uh, as the Colonel mentioned, uh, prior to launch, we weren't sure if it was a missile that brought him down or uh, some kind of mechanical uh, malfunction. We elected to go with the mindset of worst case scenario. Uh, so that uh, 
drove me to stay high and force and, and have my wingman do nothing but keep his eyes out into the target area to make sure uh, we didn't become a, a secondary casualty in this. Also, we knew that there was about six vehicles pursuing uh, the pilot. Uh, he had been made, uh, evading for about six kilometers uh, from where he landed in his parachute. I uh, didn't know the nature of those vehicles that were uh, going uh, going after him. Also, his weapon systems officer, it was a two-seat F-15 that went down, uh, was not located. Those were, that was the information that I had uh, available to me. The F-16, who was on station before me, had uh, conducted a couple of uh, gun attacks uh, to deter the pursuers who were trying to go after uh, the pilot. Uh, shortly thereafter, he was uh, at a time when he needed to go to the tanker to get more gas, so I, I relieved him as the on-scene commander. Uh, at that time, uh, I started talking with the pilot directly, finding out more about the situation, what he was facing on the deck, told him what ordnance I had on board, which were two 500-pound laser-guided weapons, and my wingman had one uh, laser-guided uh, weapon uh, as well. Uh, at that point, he, he described what he was seeing on the deck, which was you could see one of the vehicles with a uh, spotlight on uh, that was getting near to his location. He could hear dogs barking in the distance. He could hear gunfire uh, as well. I quickly looked outside. It was, it was a beautiful night. Uh, as the CEO mentioned, uh, middle of the night, uh, a bright moon in the sky. Uh, conditions were, were perfect that night for the re recovery effort. I was able to look out and in the middle of the desert there, see a vehicle slowly meandering through the desert with a spotlight going to 360 degrees uh, looking for the pilot. So I immediately identified that as the vehicle that was, was trying to get him. I then plotted in the difference between where I was seeing that target and his last known location. And I told him, or I asked if he, if he felt he needed one of the, uh, the, the bombs for my jet. He said, yes, I do. And at that point, I. Uh, made my way out to a position to actually employ the bomb. As I was making my way out there, he said, hey, please please tell my wife I love her. And again, just the gravity of the situation really hit home with me at, at that moment. I said, don't worry, uh, I will have a bomb on the deck in, in two minutes, help is on the way, uh, stay calm. And uh, at that point, I uh, was in a position to release the, release the weapon and I uh, was able to successfully guide that to a direct impact. Once the uh, Dust settled from that explosion. I was able to see another vehicle that I hadn't noticed before still in the area. I asked him again, would, you know, are you feeling threatened? Do we need, a, we need another weapon? He said, yes, please please uh, drop another one. So I, again, dropped a, a second 500-pound uh, bomb in the area. Once that one impacted, I could actually see in my sensor of a vehicle come through it and make an immediate U-turn, finally getting the message that, hey, uh, it's probably time to uh, go elsewhere. Uh, at that time, I, I began to focus my efforts on picking a suitable location uh, for the uh, Ospreys who were airborne and not making their way to the objective at this point. Uh, part of my Marine Corps history was being a forward air controller on the ground, being with a grunt unit. So I had worked with uh, Ospreys and other helicopters, had a little idea of, of what they would need for a landing zone. So I spent some time uh, referencing the, the location of the pilot that I knew and finding an area that was somewhat clear, no obstacles such as uh, power lines and so forth. Uh, once I had that identified, uh, then I passed it to him over the radio so that they could update their system and steer uh, more quickly uh, to, to the objective area. Uh, as well, the, the, the pilot's lead aircraft, the other F-15 had made its way back from the tanker, as well as that F-16, they had both joined me in the, in the stack overhead, and I just asked that they help me uh, keep their eyes peeled for any other uh, vehicles that might be entering the area. Um, we all did our part of talking to the pilot and you know, telling him things of take a, take a sip of water, remain calm, and, and then help us on the way. And I'm uh, on another frequency talking to them saying, um, hurry up, uh, give, it, give her all she's got. Uh, and at that point, I was nearing my, my fuel that I needed to go to the tanker, so I, I handed the on-scene commander over to the F-16 above me. Now I'll, I'll turn it over to Brillo to pick up the story. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Eric Cole, B-22 guy with 266. Uh, I'll say a couple things. When this started for me, I was in the wardroom. We uh, we had six of our Ospreys were still in Afghanistan, so we had four aircraft aboard the uh, Kearsarge. So for B-22 wise, we we had one alert window that we could support. Uh, luckily, and, you know, we we scheduled that during the night. 
kind of a day into night type of window because we figure that's when the, the highest risk is uh, of losing somebody. Uh, and, and it worked out for us. Uh, I was in the ward room, the uh, XO rolls in, says, Brother, get your butt down the ready room. You know, there's that, that 15 just went down. So so we head down there. CJ's already down there. He's got his speed jeans on. He's walking out to his airplane. And uh, at that point, uh, we get our little final intel update and uh, location of the survivor. The ship was uh, in, the, in the Gulf of Sidra, uh, about where it's located there. <coughs> I think when CJ launched, they were about 180 nautical miles away. Uh, the Commodore had that, you know, full cold going on the uh, the ship towards Benghazi. Uh, and the, uh, the pilot ejected, uh, here's Benghazi, just to the east, about 12 miles is where the uh, the pilot was located. Uh, there was an SA-5, which is a uh, pretty decent surface-to-air uh, radar uh, and an aircraft system. That was actually slated to be hit that night, and uh, so that was a significant issue for us. Also. Uh, you know, while CJ was able to stay up pretty high, about 25K, which kind of kept them clear of a lot of that man pad threat for us with the V-22, the altitude we were flying, that was something that we had to take into account as well. Uh, a couple things about the Osprey, and uh, I'll, I'll admit right now I drank the Kool-Aid, and, and for all of you in this room who, who helped and stuck with that thing and got it to us, I really appreciate it. But uh, what the Osprey allowed us to do when we launched, we were about 160 <coughs> nautical miles away. Uh, Benghazi and all the built up area were here between us and the pilot, but the speed and the range of the V-22 allowed us to push out to the east, avoid all that built up area and all that threat, and, uh, and then push south once we got over more, uh, you know, sparsely uh, populated terrain. Uh, a couple other things the V-22 does, uh, when I was in Iraq with it, our big threat was small arms fire. Those guys taking pot shots at us with, with AK-47s, RPKs, things like that. <coughs> So in the V-22 in Iraq, we would routinely fly 9, 10,000 feet because that kept us safe from, from all that type of threat. Uh, with the uh, radar systems that we were worried about here, we elected to go low. So we came in about 270, 275 knots, which is about 310 miles an hour at uh, 200 feet on this night. And that kept us underneath the uh, threat. Uh, we do some last minute planning. We uh, they just launched uh, CJ and his section off the jet, or off the, uh, the deck, and now they've pulled out our aircraft. One little note aside, like I said, we only have four airplanes. A couple of them are undergoing some, some, some serious maintenance, like all aircraft do in the, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Marine Corps inventory. They have maintainers on top of the one they were pulling out in the middle of the night, ripping an auxiliary power unit out of the, uh, the top of the airplane putting it in not once but twice because the seal busted. So that's, that's kind of like changing the engine on your car twice in, in 40 minutes at night to get that plane ready to go. So uh, definitely uh, some perseverance on, on the part of the Marines out there. Uh, we manned up, we got spun up. Each V-22 carried 15 uh, reconnaissance Marines in the back, so we had a total of 30 for the trap force. Uh, we can carry more than that, but uh, that's, that's what they elected to go with, and it also left a little bit of room in there, you know, for picking up other people. Uh, we launched off the deck, we're pushing inbound. At this point, I hear CJ, he's talking to the guy, I hear that CJ's dropping bombs out there. Uh, we know that he's being pursued, and uh, we, we can kind of hear what's going on, and, and you know, very much the urgency in his voice, let's go guys, let's go, come on, you guys need to hurry up. So, uh, although uh, we were originally gonna go around uh, the SA-5 completely, uh, we figured, you know what, we're good, we'll cut the corner a little bit, and. Uh, We'll, we'll accept the, uh, the risk just a little. Uh, we're pushing in. I'm feeding as much of that information as I'm hearing on the radio over the CSAR freak to the recon guys in the back, because they're up, they're up uh, on the intercom in the aircraft. Because with all the, uh, the stuff that's going on out there, you know, it's the middle of the night, they're in the back of a noisy airplane, we're gonna land, there's gonna be a lot of dust and, and, and wind and noise. And oh, by the way, there probably could be bullets coming in the back of the airplane as these guys are running off to try to find these guys. So I'm trying to build a picture of the recon guys in the back as much as I can. Uh, out over the uh, ocean, we were at about 500 feet. We didn't want to get too low because when you're flying over water at night, you don't get a lot of reference and uh, it's, it's pretty easy to put it right into the water. So, but as we uh, approached the shore and we got, we saw, we started seeing uh, Libya, we dropped down to 200 feet. And at that point, we followed the terrain as much as we could inbound to the uh, objective crater. Uh, CJ's grade he gave us was excellent. It was probably only a couple hundred yards where we ended up picking up the guy. 
At that point, uh, we're talking to F-16 overhead, giving them just three minutes out, two minutes out, one minute out. Uh, I was the second aircraft. Of the, I started dropping back a little bit off of leaves, giving them a little extra space, because one issue uh, landing in the desert for us is, is severe brownout. So when an aircraft comes in, uh, you know, especially out in the deserts, uh, I wanted to give them a little extra room just to see how badly he was going to brown out, and then it also would give me a better chance to pick a decent landing spot. As we're about 15 seconds out, the F-16 overhead uh, laser designated the zone, so on our night vision goggles, they shine down a little sp uh, strobing laser beam that you know, points out exactly where the, uh, the location of the survivor was. When they turned that on, lead was pretty much over it already, so he wasn't going to be able to land it, uh, immediately, so he, he came back around. But uh, we had eyes on in the second aircraft and landed about 50 yards in front of the guy. Uh, he, he told us afterwards that he was already in our dust cloud before we even touched the ground. So we landed. <laughs> we landed, and uh, about five seconds later, the crew chief said, hey, sir, we got him. I was like, all right, well, we're out of here. And he's like, wait, all the recon Marines ran away. <laughs> Those guys, I mean, they were ready to go out. They were ready to you know, go, go, get, go get some. But uh, so it took us about another 30 seconds to get them all back on board. <laughs> And I said, count everybody. <laughs> so we counted them, and then I said, all right, now count everybody again. Because the last thing I want to do is leave somebody in, in Libya. Uh, we had everybody aboard. At this, by this point, Lee had come back around and was setting up the land. And I was like, hey, we've got him. We're ready to go. So he never even landed. He just kept going. And uh, we picked up and pushed north again very low and fast and uh, pushed back out to sea. Uh, a couple other things I just wanted to say is, I felt uh, we never got any radar indications on our uh, on our systems. Uh, I felt we were an incredibly hard target to hit. I thought that I was thinking to myself, I'm really happy I'm flying in an Osprey right now, as fast as we were going to be able there to get there and get him. I'm pretty sure that major was was pretty damn happy that Ospreys were coming to get him. The next fastest asset that was in the area, and that was sea based, were uh, HH-60s. Uh, combat search and rescue helicopters, it would have taken them another 45 minutes longer to go in there to get them. He didn't have another 45 minutes. So I'm not going to say that B-22s are always necessary for trap, but for this one, without Ospreys, this trap wouldn't have happened. Um, that's, uh, that's about it for, the, uh, for that piece of it. <coughs> all we have to say about that. <laughs> All right. Next slide, please. Uh, this is old guys wrapping up. It's hard to follow those guys. So uh, we've talked about a lot of these things. Uh, you get, uh, you get, uh, okay, what you want to hear? So, well, there's really there's two key takeaways we want to leave you with: disaggregated operations and sea basing. First one: disaggregated operations. It's the way the Navy and Marine Corps are doing business right now. It's the way of life. Why? Because it allows a relatively small force to have multiple effects over a large geographic area. So how can we enhance how we do it? And we say uh, our recommendations based on our observations and experiences over this eight and a half month deployment include these. So modest enhancements to the LSD-41 class, that's the car hall was the ship that represented that class. As far as their ability to communicate long range and exercise command and control, uh, and some some really modest hardware enhancements to, to help that ship along. It's about midway in its life. Navy Marine Corps is going to be using the LSD-41 class for at least another 15 to 20 years. So uh, we think some modest enhancements in their in their C4I systems would facilitate the way we do business these days. Next one is a third. Uh, MH-60 Sierra, for those who are not familiar, this is a Navy helicopter. Two of them are typically embarked on an LHD, a big deck amphib, for search and rescue. But recently they've been upgraded to have an armed uh, component, armed kit. So this gives them a mission of more than just search and rescue. It also gives them the ability to help defend the art from surface threats, small fast attack craft and other, and other threats. It also is an ideal platform for hellborn uh, visit board search and seizure, HBBSS. In other words, uh, if you need to take down a pirated vessel uh, with a marine raiding force, uh, 
those Marines will probably want to be on an MH60 Sierra as we uh, trained to during the you know, prior to the deployment, and as we saw, uh, well, I'll leave it as we trained to prior to the deployment. So right now, like I said, only two helicopters are deployed. It doesn't allow you to fully exploit that armed capability, uh, and really kind of limits you to just do to just doing search and rescue or doing these other missions. We believe a third helicopter would allow us to do multiple missions and fully exploit the new capability of this, this airframe. Uh, we also validated during our pre-deployment workups that the Big Deck Amphib can accommodate a third MH-60 Sierra while still supporting a full ACE. That's the, air, that's the Marine Air Combat Element, if you're not familiar with that acronym. Training, training to disaggregated ops. And what we mean by this primarily is what we saw at the staff level, the command and control level. How do you manage and balance when you have your units spread across not only one theater, but multiple theaters? You have to now provide intelligence support, not just focused <coughs> in one area, but focused over multiple areas. So how do you, how do, you do that? Uh, how do you work through that? Same thing with your communications. If you're uh, managing satellite bandwidth, communication plans across multiple theaters to support your disaggregated units, you need to think through those things. Uh, and the last two, I'm going to turn over to, to Mark to, uh, to address. Okay. Here, well, I think what you do is just go to the next slide. And, let them, and this is kind of the. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm taking the C base. Let's go ahead and we'll do that. And in the wrap up, I'll cover some of these. Okay. So we want to do C base. Okay. So the other key take, takeaway is C base. And again, this is really where we, sh we show or highlight those unique capabilities of the forward deployed Navy and Marine Corps team when they operate from a sea base. Uh, the, the inherent flexibility, we conducted the full spectrum of operations. This, this, this one unit, this RVU, did everything from humanitarian assistance to combat operations. They did it from the sea, and they did it uh, in a persistent, flexible manner, uh, providing the combatant commander with options. Uh, each ship, in turn, not only performs a sea base for our embarked Marine Expeditionary Unit, but also performs a sea base for other uh, branches as well, uh, and each ship did that in turn. Kearsarge uh, for national tasking in CENTCOM supported Special Operations Forces. Of course, we also supported uh, our Marines during Odyssey Dawn. Carter Hall also performed as a sea base for about two months of the deployment uh, for Special Operations uh, Task Force. And Ponce hosted that combat search and rescue uh, Air Force uh, helicopter detachment that uh, uh, Brillo mentioned. Uh, during Odyssey Dawn, they they operated from Ponce, performing as a sea base. So what you know what these naval and by naval I mean Navy Marine Corps units, what they provide uh, in this sea base is the ability to pick up and move and position themselves wherever needed by the combatant commander for as ever long as he needs them, uh, and provides those those uh, options. <coughs> okay. Uh, next slide. I think that's. The that's your wrapping up slide. Right, right. okay, there you go. Um, you know, I, I knew when Lightning hit me a few years ago when I was slated to take over the 26th Marine Expedition Unit that it was going to be what I, I call a singular opportunity in life. And uh, I had it partially right. Yeah, I mean, certainly the things that we got to do were, you know, I mean, wow, you know, that's, those, are, those are things you'll I'll remember till Alzheimer's. Um, but, you know, the, your whole career, I was promised in 1986 as I went through flight school that by 1988 I'd be flying the B-22. I have flown in a B-22. So I've got that going for me. But, but the, the real treat was, you know, all the things that I grew up on, and I keep looking to my left because, you know, the, the next thing to the Messiah for the Marine is General Grace. And I'm sorry if I, if I embarrass you by saying that, but all those visions that we had when I was younger that are, are carried forward by people like General Stoller and with the help of Mr. Young and, and so many others, um, to, to, to bring the vision of what the V-22 can bring, uh, the, the KC-130J and how it really enables the whole MAGTAP in so many ways, it's, it's the behind the scenes player that really powers so much of the things that we're able to do. Um, you know, the, the AV-8B, which someday when we get the F-35 being the, the short takeoff vertical landing capability. We, we saw all those things coming together. You know, those are parts of the vision that we have for what we can do from uh, big deck ships. Many of us are familiar with the state of our amphibious fleet. We know where we want it to be, and we gotta keep, we gotta keep you know, stomping our feet on that kind of stuff. 
you know, those were, those were, those were privileges for me. Uh, but hopefully what the other thing you saw in here, which was my real takeaway, was, was the people thing. And I know that sounds you know, trite, but, but you know, when you, when you got Marines doing what they did to start the deployment in Pakistan, that was the beginning of a long deployment. I uh, worked in the, in the conditions and what they did. And, you know, we were on the hill with, uh, you know, uh, House and Senate staffers at the same age. We were all in coats and ties and dresses and all that. You know, our same kids are out there and dungarees and stuff. The same bright kids are just contributing in a different way. We're really out there doing it. And, and the courage they bring, because the same wounded warriors that we have in Afghanistan, every kid's got that in them. It's just that, you know, the yeah, IE didn't get them that day. Uh, they all bring that to them. You know, the, the changing of an APU in the middle of the night because you know there's someone out there that you better get out to before somebody else does. You know, loading bombs in the middle of the night so CJ can turn it around, get back out there, and take care of bad guys. I think it was on and on and on. Reaching out to schools in Kenya. Uh, what a tremendous privilege to have the job that I have. It is, and I've said this since day one, I had the best job in the world. I really did. So uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, everybody, who provided all those resources. And for me, I just had a flag and got to stand in front of it all once in a while. But it was, it was a great ride. I think we covered all this stuff. Uh, the only thing we didn't talk about were Djibouti and Kuwait. Uh, does anybody know where Djibouti is? It's a lovely place. I recommend it in the summer. Uh, I've unfortunately spent uh, too many summers there. Strategic geography, if there ever was, for those that, that may not know exactly, it's at the southern end of the Red Sea. I can name six of the seven maritime choke points in the world. Ninety-five percent of the world's commerce goes by goes by mar maritime uh, shipping. All right, so you at some point you go through those choke points. Two of them are right there: the Babel Mendeb Straits, right next to Djibouti, and up north of the Red Sea is the Suez Canal. Strategic in that sense. Strategic in the sense that it's right between mm -hmm. Yemen. And Somalia, that whole nexus of terrorism and all those bad acting things to include piracy that happened there. A government very friendly to the United States, a strong country team, live fire training maneuver areas, base that we have there in the CGA table. A strategic investment. Uh, so many of the things that we did when we had to reconstitute some of the abuse capabilities, when we locked off 1,400 people and a bunch of things from the view. We, we reinvented ourselves in Spirit. <coughs> Uh, to a, a another degree, we reinvented ourselves in Kuwait, plus it was a power projection platform for us. And Kuwait is not, not like that, that group so much, but that's where we brought all the ships, that's where we coalesced them at, and that's where we shot it off from. Uh, two, if you're in, in the Central Command AOR, Djibouti actually belongs to Africa. Vital sustainment training, vital things you get out of there to include logistics for the ships and everything else we do. Kuwait, vital to what we do. Unfortunately, when I briefed uh, that to Admiral Harvey and General Halleck about uh, two weeks ago, they, they did the, the Tinsock Peace on me. Because we think we're going to be out of Kuwait in a couple of years. A little lesson. Uh, when you do engagement, when you do theater security cooperation, the, the, rule, the rule number one is it's about the host nation, first, foremost, and always. Any training we get is a byproduct. So when you're looking at sustainment training for all those things we do from the left to the right hand of the spectrum, that stuff atrophies. You've got to keep refreshing. You've got Djibouti. Hopefully we can keep that long term to keep the investment. But without Kuwait, there is no other place in the Central Command AOR that I'm aware of where you could do U.S. training as your first priority. So uh, uh, Secretary Mavis is going to hear that from us on Wednesday. Uh, a little bit of that. So uh, that's what those two bullets are about. And I think we've, uh, hopefully, uh, we've made everything else we want to talk about into a corpse for you today. So uh, put in your questions. Thank you very much. Sir. What ended up being the cause of the ejection from the aircraft? To our knowledge, it was a mechanical malfunction. Uh, we never got any further detail than that. What, what was the role of the ESG? Uh, I mean, that must have been very interesting to have that staff presence there for the 
your charge, but uh, in the command relationship, uh, you can talk about that. Yes, sir. It's always good to have your boss 50 feet down the hall. Um, <laughs> um, you know, Admiral Klein and, uh, and a couple of folks from her staff came aboard uh, while we were off Egypt, sir. Uh, the main thing to be is uh, provide a flag level interface with, with other actors out there. And that was, you know, as you know, when we trained at our MU, when we trained an Navy Marine Corps team, Pete and I trained together for six months before we ever deployed. So I realized we, we need uh, new supervision. You know that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, she was brought on board for that reason to have someone right there. And, and Libya came through, and she just came right through with us. And, and uh, we, I, had, I was very fortunate. We had great freedom of action. Uh, you know, there was uh, lovely VTCs for about the first two and a half hours of our day every day, where Vice Admiral Harris was on that one of them, and Admiral uh, Lockyer on the other, and, and we uh, got to uh, speak freely uh, about the operations. Uh, but the biggest, the, the, the biggest benefit there was uh, the Mount Whitney was the flagship for both the Joint Task Force and for the Naval Component Command, and uh, they had I think eight. U.S. Navy admirals on there, if I count right, at least eight, eight admirals. So um, uh, the, the, my, my freedom of action was enhanced by having a one-star admiral with my boss on board the ship to take care of that because uh, we, we had a lot of work to conduct. So she coordinated not only for me and Pete, but also the, uh, the third Embark staff, which was the, uh, the Desert staff. The so she did provide valuable top, top cover and did allow uh, Mark and I to do our mission. And also from Sixth Fleet as well, I, I felt fairly well uh, free to position my uh, my units where they need to be to cover the missions. I never felt uh, micromanaged. Um, we had two DDGs, uh, two destroyers uh, assigned uh, TACON to me, and uh, for T-LAM missions, it was very, <coughs> Tomahawk went out to have cruise missile uh, missions. So that was very directed. Six Fleet would say, hey, position this ship here, put battery there, put staff there. And I understood that because that, those were kind of separate strike missions. But other than that, I felt I had the latitude to position my units where I needed to do it to cover the mission, uh, to strike that balance of, all right, we have to support potential trap QRF and CSAR and Misrata and Benghazi as well, so I'm going to put, you know, Pierce Arch here, I'm going to put Ponce there, and for the most part, I was given that limit. So, uh, it worked out well. Within the uh, Composite Warfare Commander, uh, organization within the ARG as far as the assignment of warfare commander duties. We had to do some re-juggling re, uh, of that once uh, CTF, uh, ESG-5 stood up as CTF-64. Uh, we had to re-adjust uh, those and reassign, make some reassignments. But uh, the net effect uh, really was that I, I had the latitude to, to uh, exercise or employ my, uh, the ARG and the passenger stores as I felt Very, very similar to uh, two four view uh, in uh, Lebanon in the summer of '06. I was having here. Uh, same great thing. You know, James Moore here. Very, very similar. Works well. It did. I, I would say uh, the chemistry between uh, the MU and the R really helped facilitate the operationally hence the deployment that we had, uh, our success I think was facilitated because we had that good chemistry between ourselves and our staffs and that just trickled down to the ships and, and, and embark marines and uh, I wish there was a way to bottle that and you know pass that down to the next uh, team but the only downside is I have eight decks that are unused to playing cards if anybody needs some. I was hoping for a lot of spades. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work out so good for me. Uh, any ISR lessons learned? For the course of the deployment, yes. Um, and I think you could talk about. Well, see, that would have been nice <laughs> I, I want to actually. I think probably Mark. I think you uh, you have uh, some passion. I don't have one. any strong emotions. So I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to defer to uh, the lefty on this one. Um, when the mute is not composite, sir, I'm the world's highest paid platoon commander. I got about 80 people just to give you a kind of a reference, and so. When a mute composites, people like General Stalder give me over 2,000 people and all kinds of toys, airplanes, vehicles, all kinds of other things across the Marine Expeditionary Force. Uh, so a lot of stewardship there. 
the one thing, the one toy, the one tool I really don't have in my quiver that I own is organically it is a, a, a flying constant stair type platform. Okay, we have a great thing in another ISR. But you know, I want to be specific because I'd, I'd be corrected personally. Uh, you know, because you need that now. And, and if I could use uh, an example here, and, and, and when we talk crisis response, and that's why I want to paint this difference here. You know, it's it, it's turnkey waiting a few days, or if the engine's running, you show up and you go. Libya was very easy for the first 12 days. Uh, we were able to take the moral high ground. The only role I have for my guys is says, guys, the only thing we can do worse than missing the enemy is hitting one of the guys who's not the enemy. Because that takes things backward both physically and, and emotionally, right? We knew for the first 12 days that the only guy who had tanks, armored personnel carriers, gun missile launchers, things of that nature, were the regime guys. You find the tank, you kill the tank. CJ's not almost as smart as CJ's 46 pilot in respect. Uh, so it was easy. But as you started to beat the regime back, he was leaving gear behind. So, like, any good force, the opposition now starts picking up a tank here and there. Conversely, like any smart enemy, and I'm not going to call Gaddafi stupid, I'll come a lot of things, but he's not stupid, nor are his guys. They're starting to figure out that, hey, if I put a machine gun on the back of a Toyota pickup truck, I don't look like a, a military guy. I look a lot like the opposition. Now you end up, as they close, with a polluted battlefield. And so this is where you start getting to the limits of air power, frankly. So now things get really hard because even if I hand CJ a picture that's 10 minutes old like before he takes off, by the time he gets there, this thing's confused because I don't know who, who's getting bad at With a UAV, you can, you can now bridge some of that. Buy yourself a little more time, if you will. Uh, but it requires you know, a dedicated <laughs> stair. Mind you, that stair is still going through a stone straw, but at least you can look at the target area. For example, when we push south of uh, Aj Dubai at this Brega area, and you still see that nowadays, where that's where the regime and the opposition really, that's where their forward line of troops are. Sorry, Connor. But if I had a constant stare, I could look at that Toyota truck and figure out which way it goes at night to be able to get three fuel to And now by, by looking at habit patterns, I know if it's good or bad. That would have been great to have right when we got there. In this case, uh, those kind of platforms didn't show up until actually Odyssey Dawn ended and uh, the NATO Unified Protector picked up. What we were able to do is, is make a trip up to uh, Podio to the Chaos up in northern Italy and talk about some of the previous things the Marine Corps has done uh, with other forces using ISR and, and, and handing off to strike aircraft. Uh, we're pretty good at that nowadays. We've done a lot of it and uh, they've used it some, some good effect. So, yeah, ISR. My question is, where do you put it when you went on the ship? Uh, <coughs> my question on Ireland is the Defense Science Board test was an ISR for coin. It's just for the public. Uh, only people who have access to the internet are allowed to see it. So. Uh, uh, but does it have any of the, rec rec the richness of the recommendations that you've just described? So let me commend it to you, my application to elaborate on it. Sure. Sure. You know, one data point doesn't make a, a let you draw a conclusion, but one thing I want to say about what you all did is in the budget review with Secretary Gates, we were having a lot of acquisition trouble with CSRX, and I became concerned about the requirements and the cost. And also, while an acquisition guy was convinced that uh, rescuing downed aviators was going to be a pickup game. And a pickup game sometimes the right assets might not be in the right places. It might not be Air Force CSRX assets, and a lot of times they were going to be MB-22 assets. And so the story you told today is a, a nice affirmation for a piece of view I took in the budget discussion with Secretary Gates. But a lot of times the guys at the best get it down power are going to be poor position in airtime assets. Uh, and I think you're approved of that. You have to be careful about overly One thing I want to ask about the vehicles, whether in Afghanistan you fell in on MRAPs. I have a special connection to MRAPs. I know the Marine Corps always has anxiety about MRAPs, the size of weight for your expeditionary mission. So maybe you could comment. 
comment about that is when they serve you and when they don't serve you and how you see that, especially after you perform that. Yes, sir. And I have to caveat this by saying, first and foremost, truth, I have not been in that case. Mm -hmm. and, and so our units uh, did receive MRAPs. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I've got to do a little bit of uh, mental recollection here. Mars sent, just coincidentally, around the same time that 3A was going in, they were building, uh, I can't remember the so acronym. It serves a needle augmentation program, the MAP. The map. It does. They the it in. So they were actually bringing MRAPs in for the, just this kind of an occasion should it have come up. Do you know if there were MRAPs or MATVs? Both. It's all sorts of they, had, they had MATVs, CAT1 MRAPs, CAT2 MRAPs. Very little redistribution was done in theater because of the MAP program. We yeah. fell so in right here. The Stratliff was already bringing them in. We fell in some Stratliff. We used a lot of underneath the uh, the waterline, our KC 130s flowing forces in. That's why, you know, for those that understand tip bending and all that, the, the start January 8th and being in combat January 30th is really high speed. <laughs> That's really fast. Uh, leveraging Kuwait because we did MRAP training with the Army up in Kuwait to, to help speed that process up. Because once we got the hint, like Marines do, we try to lead forward put our nose in the ground. Uh, so we did some of that. Uh, then we have to, Greg, Greg was in there because I actually don't like Ray Gerber, so every chance I, I had, I got rid of him and shot him off the boat. <laughs> uh, so uh, if, you, if you'd like some more uh, Afghan specific experiences, uh, Ray uh, can give you some of that. I don't know, I probably. Well, do you see needing them on the RMU, or you just don't think you're going to ever be able to accommodate them? You really think I, you're going to have to find ways to fall in on them. I think the problem we're going to have, sir, is, and I, I know you're tuned into that, is the five fingerprints of lift and what yeah. you can get on these ships. Uh, that, that challenge to my house, and I've been out of the Beltway for a couple of years, I don't think we've broken the code just yet. Mm -hmm. JD, how are you? Well, good, uh, good, sir. Thanks, uh, thanks for asking. Um, when you did the operations off of uh, Libya, Ponce and uh, Kearsarge. Uh, the Carter Hall, I assume, was doing TSC and somewhere else. Were there any issues about re aggregating the MU uh, given you know, you've gone to <coughs> Carter, essentially? Go ahead, Pete. Well, yes, Carter Hall was doing TSC. She was also doing maritime security operations, counter piracy, uh, Gulf Bay, and during that time frame. Uh, now, and I'll defer as far as the MU aggregation. Back to you, but she was she was engaged in other operational commitments, not just bilateral or something. Um, I'd say how to answer that one without getting in, in too much trouble. Um, a decision was made for the cure charge of the Ponce to come through. Uh, CENTCOM made a, a compelling argument to hang on to Carter Hall, so we actually were split amongst not only two combatant commands but in Afghanistan. Uh, even though I did not own third battalion eight Marines, still in my heart. And by the way, at the end of the day, I had to bring them all home and account for all the people and all the gear and, you know, tell General Pax what I do with all that stuff for no good explanation. Uh, so Carter Hall stayed there. Uh, as we talked about for Afghanistan, we offloaded all the Marines. We offloaded a lot of the gear. At the end of the deployment to, to DRK, for, for some folks, you got to wash down all your gear, too. So that's one of the things we were able to do in Kuwait. The other thing we did is when we gave up 3rd Battalion 8 Marines, my ground combat element at that time existed in 24 reconnaissance marines and 45 guys who were left behind from the artillery net. So what we did, because we, we, we had contingencies potentially all over the joint, uh, at that time we had our KC-130s and we had a strong communications node in Camp Fury in Kuwait. So what we did is we, we put our arty guys right there and everybody who's a marine knows an artillery man is a secondary MOS for an art, uh, uh, infantry. So we put them there, linked together with C2 and linked with the KC-130s, so that should anything happen anywhere, whether it be Karachi, Sanaa, anywhere in the region, we could just jump them out of 130 and shoot them where they needed to go. So that's why we had them in Kuwait at the time, plus the fact that our ship was kind of held hostage. So that was the context of that. Eventually, April 5th, I want to think, we finally got her all the well, way around. April 17th, I believe. So. No, you're, yeah, you're so, uh, it took a while to get her back in our fold, not by our choice. Uh, yes, 
Yes, sir. Sir, Major McCavick from uh, Inquiry Marine Corps. Uh, going to acquisitions, and I saw your comments on the MHE. We'll kind of push that forward, deploy uh, elements coming off of future CH-53s, what might be looked at on there to give you capacity to roll on roll off a single aircraft. Uh, as, as a member of the Sedgwick, equipment to shortfalls that you have for deployed, try and get that equipment there quickly as possible from someplace within the, the service. Uh, I saw your comments in that, sir, I'll take that back. Uh, Are you talking about the uh, humanitarian assistance in Pakistan in particular? No, sir, Sedgwick in with the 3A going into Afghanistan. Uh, we looked at what Marson was identifying as equipment shortfalls that you were going to need in theater when you hit the ground. We are trying to uh, acquire that someplace in the service and get it to you as fast as possible. Uh, last bit, uh, working some of the issues of creating doctrine and policy for disaggregated operations. How would you hope that the service is clarified for an ARG commander or MU commander? Something needed to help you mitigate that risk as you disaggregate. Well, I, I would put it this way. Let me let me start with the other side of the equation first, because I think it's good to contrast. We we are we aggregate most often for combat. <laughs> so then, using that as your starting point, why do you disaggregate? You disaggregate for day-to-day -day engagement, serving the nation's needs when you're not fighting, so you want to build friends, right? Um, we're pretty well, we're, we're decently equipped right now. We have great command and control. The ships need to improve on the smaller decks, but the things I, I can put ashore with the Joint Task Force Enabler and the SWAN satellite systems and all that, I can spread some command and control out there, some pretty rich stuff. With the MV-22 and with the KC-130J, I've got reach so I can logistically and I can, I, 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 I can command and control out to a pretty good distance, all right? So <clears throat> there's, there's a, a logical limit to how far we should disaggregate, okay? So uh, I think, you know, that whole thing about flexible docks, I think that's the key here. And so my views, my kind of personal lessons learned are this. Our Marines and our sailors are tremendously resourceful, extremely well trained, great with small unit leadership. I will submit that that's partly, if not mostly, because of 10 years of war made us hard, made us, made us strong and resilient. So the, thing, the kind of questions we need to ask ourselves is three years after we're out of OEF, and all Marines know we turn over about a sixth of the Marine Corps every year. So three or four years after we're out of OEF, at the rank of sergeant below, we're going to probably lose all that combat experience. So retaining this volume of leadership and resourcefulness and all those lessons learned, all those things that we've learned through combat, I think is one of the things we need to look at in our training systems, whether it be 29 bombs or, or schools or what have you. So that's something to think about, uh, but retaining that. And ultimately, this has to lead to things, I, I think I would think he's talking about things like cohesion. Can you believe it, sir? <laughs> Um, you know, it, but you know, small unit leader, ultimately cohesion. At the end of the day, um, when we do our pre-deployment pre training program, I really don't care what happens in any individual event. Training is training; it's all good. Uh, for me personally, what I'm what I'm looking at is the individual, the independent platoon commanders and the company commanders, guys like that, because they're not on the same ship as me. I may not see them after we get on the ship for a whole deployment. So I am actually making judgments the whole way on chance encounters sometimes. <coughs> okay, he's my tank platoon commander. Is he a fire forget weapon, or do I need to make sure I got somebody over the top of him when I send him down range? You're making these kind of judgments, because at the end of the day, for me, the, the logical extreme is how far I'm willing to disaggregate is my trust and confidence with the individual Marine and sailor that I send down range. So, you know, so when you when you look at your doctrine, if that's what we're gonna do, uh, I would, you know, that whole about the OPF and all that cool stuff. I think that's going to be the big thing that we have to consider. And, and I, I only plead that we never let command or judgment be the last thing that we think about that as the front end. Mark, uh, I mean, operationally, disaggregation is is a problem when when the org is disaggregated for a Navy-specific mission for long periods of time, where essentially you end up with the MAGCAP riding around on a ship without a mission. 
that, that, that's a huge problem for the Navy and the Marine Corps. And, and that's, that's the operational challenge for both the Navy and the Marine Corps. If, if I could, you, you, thank you, sir, you brought up a great point. Not the president or the general, but because it's a great point. <laughs> a sick fan, the colonel, I, I made it. <laughs> no. I, I mentioned Djibouti and Kuwait, and how you do it, because you, know, you don't want to aggregate. So there are times, even during your deployment, when you need to aggregate and come back and train to those things. And that's why those things like Djibouti and all that. <coughs> and, and you're right. They're, you know, because of the way the operational world is, uh, the components will lead you to segregate because they need that work to get done. So we always have to kind of push back against it, and that's why people like you know, General Stalbert are so helpful to us, is they know you got to let them get together once in a while so they can be good at fighting wars and doing those other, you know, point things that we do, like kill the enemy. Thank you, sir, for much. We've got time for one more question before we turn the floor over to General Gray and then uh, drink some beer, soda, and wine. I'm going to make a nice speech very short. Yeah. <laughs> For anyone who's thirsty, sir, that's okay. <laughs> no more questions. Who knew? All right. <laughs> well, I, uh, yeah, let, me, uh, let me just say to the Commodore and to the Colonel, thank you for a superb brief. And I, uh, I've had a few briefings in my day, but I don't think I've had any, any better than that one. Thank you very much. We're uh, we're damn lucky to have Thank you guys. You. I uh, I think too that uh, it, uh, the one thing I was thinking about as you were briefing it was uh, it came through loud and clear. Uh, our idea of having a, a marine officer is really a magtab officer, a marine air ground logistics team officer. I mean, here you have an aviator who uh, who talked more about the ground than uh, than I could have, and so that's pretty good. And that's what it's really all about. I. Uh, I'm supposed to give the Commodore and, uh, and the Colonel a coin, a Pips coin. That takes care of my official responsibility. <laughs> but for the Marines, I got one of my coins, if you want. So you can share it. Okay. <laughs> uh, I do want to say one thing. I couldn't help but think uh, uh, 26 years ago in April, we were uh, briefing the, uh, the Marine Expeditionary Unit, ARG, uh, the Amphibious Ready Group Expeditionary Unit uh, <coughs> Special Operations Capable Program, <coughs> excuse me, for the final time here in, in Washington. And we had, uh, there were 18 missions uh, assigned, 18 tasks. And the last one was the TRAP mission, the tactical <coughs> recovery of, uh, of aircraft and personnel. And the uh, the people in the Pentagon, and the mighty Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the civilians that support them, uh, turned the 18th mission down. And they said, absolutely not. You cannot do the uh, trap mission because uh, it's, it's an Air Force mission. Uh, CSAR, Search and Rescue, is an Air Force Rules and Mission. And so uh, we went back to Norfolk with 17 missions instead of 18. And I remember we, uh, we had gotten permission uh, for the command in Norfolk to uh, send a message out to all the unified commanders and to uh, everybody in Washington and announce this program. And so we put the 18th mission back in. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, we put the trap mission back in against rules, against the regulations, and uh, which, of course, uh, is really not a bad idea. The more rules you can break around here, the better off you are. <laughs> we put that mission back in. And I remember uh, one of the staff officers said, but listen, they told you in Washington to take that mission out. And I said, yeah, I know, but uh, if, uh, if, uh, if an airplane goes down, if a US airplane goes down, or a NATO airplane goes down, and anywhere in the world, and, uh, and the Navy and the Ranger are nearby, then the nation is going to expect them to do something about it. And, and we're going to make sure you know how. And so I, I mention that because the lesson there is that uh, sometimes the closer you get to Washington, the foggier it can be. So uh, don't be afraid to trust your own judgment in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.